All right, for this afternoon's class, we will be, it will be divided into two parts. So part one, we look at some ways that you appraise projects that you have. Uh, principally, in this first part, we look at the book rate of return, something that we would have covered when we did ratio analysis. And then we look at something uh, new today, which is payback period. You calculate the payback period. And then we look at the internal rate of return, which is otherwise called the discounted cash flow rate of return. Right? And then we look how do we choose capital investments when resources are scarce. Right? So in the latter, we look at those projects, programs, uh, business ventures that will add the most value to whatever we um, but the options that we have to undertake. All right. So someone is asking about the test. So the test is actually, I'm not sure if I, well, I didn't check back to see if I put the wrong date, but the tests or the remaining five tests would be on Sundays. So even if I put Saturdays, just, just ignore that. And it will be just as, we did last week, it will be open all day on Sunday. So we open for 24 hours. Right. So sir, we're ignoring the date and it will be on this Sunday instead of Saturday. Correct. So all tests would be on okay. Sundays. So I would have gotten that one wrong. Right. So they're all okay. on Sunday. Thank you. So when we look at MPV, there are three points that we should remember. And the first one is that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. And the premise of that statement is if you're promised, if you're given the option of receiving a dollar today or receiving one, let's say in a year's time, the reason why a dollar today is worth more than that dollar that you receive tomorrow is because you can take the dollar that you have today and invest it. And hopefully if your investments add value, it will, be, it will be worth more than the dollar that you get tomorrow. And even if you do the minimal investment or the safest investment to invest um, in a bank that offers interest on your deposits, then certainly the dollar that you have today will be worth more than the one that you, you'll be getting tomorrow, simply because you don't have the option of investing a dollar you receive tomorrow um, anytime sooner. So that's the premise of why a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. But I should also add that it's not, now it's a case that's not always when you put money in the bank that you get interest. A matter of fact, uh, there are some countries now that you the interest are so, well, some of them offer no interest on your deposits and you actually have to pay to keep them on the bank. So, I mean, they take it out as charges and so forth and you get zero interest, right? And that's one of the reasons for that is that because in some countries, the supply of capital is so saturated and the opportunities for fruitful investments are so limited that the banks don't, I mean, cannot give you interest, right? Then... So net present, the second point to always remember is that net present value is based on an estimation of cash flow. So the amount, so you estimate business a business. If it's a project, you know, the assets that you require for that project to materialize, the revenue that you will garner from that venture, and secondly, the cost that you expect to incur so those are the cost elements. And then of course you have to estimate what is the opportunity cost to capital using whatever model that you have as a business or whatever benchmark you use. Tomorrow, the second one is that in arriving at net present value, it is based on forecasted figures on budgeted figures or estimated figures. And then the second 
And then the final thing to remember about net present value is that having calculated those values, because they're all standardized in, in a particular period, um, more than likely, well, standardizing today's value, then you can always add them up together, right? So the net present value, if you have two projects A and B is equivalent to, or the net present value of A and B is equivalent to the net present value of A plus the net present value of B. Book rate of return and payback. So the book rate of return is the average income divided by the average book value over project life. It is also called the accounting rate of return. And the formula is given as book income upon book assets. Again, that's average book income upon average book assets. And the reason why we use average is to just reduce as much as possible the, the fluctuations that may occur over that project life. Uh, there are some industries that have, uh, that are seasonal. So you, the two that comes to mind are those in, in the ag agricultural sector. So you know, they have a time to, so their revenues are, you know, they, they get their revenues when it's ripping season. Similarly to the tourism industry, particularly let's look at in the Caribbean, they get a bulk of their, they generate a bulk of their revenues in over the winter and uh, fall, winter, spring period, right? That's when the snowboards come out to the Caribbean to, to get some um, warm temperatures. So if you're looking at industries or companies in those or investments in those industries, it would be better to look um, over a longer period that takes into account those fluctuations. Right? The accounting rate of return as a measure, as an assessment tool for, for whether or not you should undertake project is seldom the final tool that, will, that you will use. It is essentially a screening tool, an initial screening tool before you do a deeper dive into whether or not the options of the projects ahead of in front of you are worthwhile undertaking. Right. So this is just the initial screening test that is mostly done to ensure that. So when companies prepare their financials, they could they can uh, calculate the accounting rate of return. Right. So they can look at the income that they would have generated in that particular period and take the average assets over that period. Right. So companies can look at it at a year or two years or however long they have a, their information. And then they'll compare the project that is in front of them as, an op, as, as a possible uh, investment to see what that estimated accounting uh, rate of return, just to ensure that the, uh, that proposed project or investment is on par with what has already happened in the company, right? So it's just that initial, one of the initial screening um, tools that is available to managers to decide whether or not to undertake a project or decide, or in the case of accounting rate of return, whether to do a deeper dive um, to get behind the numbers, to test the assumptions and so forth. Right. And the reason why it's not taken seriously is because Accounting figures are open to manipulation, or if I want to use a little bit um, a soft word uh, these days, it's something that you call earnings management, but it's manipulation by, by the management team um, who sometimes will do that because they have bonuses attached and, and so forth, right? So they will ensure that uh, if there are liabilities that they can not recognize, and get away with it, then they will not recognize those liabilities. Uh, so you wouldn't drive down profits. So profits are, are inflated. And you know, in that way, accounting figures are less reliable when you're looking at um, going into investing in future projects, right? 
And this is despite all the improvements in, or the continued improvements in the, the accounting standards, the auditing standards. Those of you who might have done audits before, you know that there is a, something you call a detection risk in financial when you're auditing. So what happens is that an auditor, it would be, it wouldn't be cost effective for an auditor to go into a company and audit every single transaction. Of course, there are situations that that happen, but that's, uh, that's a different kind of assurance exercise. But in order to you audit by samples, you set benchmarks. So experienced managers will know that, or what they call materiality levels, just to get the language correct. So auditors will set materi materiality levels and experienced managers will know that um, some of the material materiality benchmarks are something like 1% of revenue or 5% of assets. So they will ensure that the transactions that they manipulate are below those thresholds because they know the likelihood of the auditor detecting that it's slim, right? So that's the reason why um, financials aren't, when you're looking at decision-making, final decision-making, these aren't the final tools that you use. So the payback period is, is, is a period that essentially you look at the investment that you've taken and the payback period is, the, is that amount of time normally measured in years and months that you will take to recover that initial investment. So let's say you would have invested a million dollars right, as the initial investment. And then what you do, you estimate your cash flows for whatever period, for, for, for several periods going forward. And then you look at that period that you would have um, recouped that $1 million. So let's say if in the first year you had cash flow of 200,000, the second year, 300,000, the third year, 500,000. Then when you add those up together, you get a million dollars. So, you, you know, your payback period would be those million, that million dollars initially invested would have been recovered in three years. All right, so that's plain and simple how the payback period goes. If you would have read the text and look at the examples they would have given, the way they have done it is to just look at it by years. <coughs> But the more precise manner to do it is to do it by years and months. So going back to the example that I just gave of a million dollars, let's say the cash flow remain 200,000 the first year, 300,000 in the second year, and then the third year they had 400,000. So you're up to 900,000 after three years. And let's say in the fourth year, the total amount of revenue they generated was 600,000. Right, you assume that that 600,000 is earned equally over that fourth year. But of course, you're just looking for 100,000 of that 600,000. So to get the payback period, it would have been that 100,000 over that 600,000 multiplied by 12 months. So that would have given you two months. So the, the actual payback period in this example would have been three years, two months. So that's a more precise way to do it. So you do it in, 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 in um, years plus months. And the underlying assumption is that revenue is generated equally over the year uh, when you have to get that additional revenue just to make up and recover your initial capital outlay. Any questions? So in applying the payback period, management or whoever is in charge, who has the final say, might be the board of directors, would have a policy position with regards to new investment. So they will say something simple as this. The policy will say something simple, simple as this, that new investment should have a payback period of four years or five years or whatever period they, they choose based on whatever um, considerations they, they've taken. 
So what it means is whenever the management team presents a proposal for an investment, then they have to ensure that based on their calculations that they can recover the initial investment based on that benchmark that um, let's say the board have set of four years or five years, right? So once they would have run their figures, they know if they're below that benchmark of let's say four years that the project is gonna be approved. If not, it would not, it wouldn't um, management, the board will say no. So that's simply the payback rule. It's based on a benchmark that is set by management, a policy decision, a policy position. And if you don't make that, then they'll just reject um, the investment. So one of the weaknesses of the payback period is that it totally ignores uh, cash flows beyond the period that the total capital outlay is recovered. So you might find in the example that I gave that let's say the payback period set by management was three years and we will only recover 900,000 in three years, then management would have said no, and we would have missed the opportunity of earning 600,000 um, in the 60, in the fourth year, right? And based on whatever, you know, if we would have taken it a step forward, forward and look at um, discounting those cash flows, then it would have been what the real value would have been, right? So one of the weaknesses with the payback period is that it completely ignores cash flows that are outside the policy period set by management. Are there any questions? Okay. All right. But whoever the person is, just mute the mics. If I go offline, because I'm getting a Zoom is hanging up now, I'll just return in a minute. All right, not sure what happened there. Good. So as we continue in this example now that we share, the examples that I gave you verbally just now look at the, and those cash flows were nominal cash flows. To make the, or to improve on, on the way payback is calculated, there's an option of including a opportunity cost of capital, and then we discount those cash flows. So you, it is what we call a discounted payback period, All right? So we're given an example here that says you have three projects, right? 
they all require an initial outlay of 2000 and project A lasts for three periods, project B for two and project C for two periods. And then we're given the cash flows for project A, you have 500 in the first and second period, and then 5,000 in the third period, right? Project B, you have a cash flow inflow of 500 in the first period, 1,800 in the second. For C, you have 1,800 in the first and 500 in the second. We're assuming here that the cost of capital is 10%. And the policy here is that any project that doesn't uh, recoup the capital outlay in two years would be rejected. So just by eyeballing this, you'll see that having worked out the, the present value of the cash flows, you'll see that for project A, it doesn't even get to 900. It's 868. Right, so you do not recover policy that the company has of two years or less, the payback period should be, then project A would be rejected. And just to highlight the weakness of payback period, you see they're ignoring a significant windfall in the third period, which is $5,000, which is two and a half times the investment, right? So you're missing out if you discount that at 10% on cash flows of 3,757. So just by having a strict payback period, you'd have lost the opportunity of having a significant windfall in the third year, right? So that really highlights the weakness of the payback period. Then B, you would, you would see that it, you would not have recovered um, the capital outlay of of 2000, right? And then C, you would have. A question to you is why the difference between B and C when the nominal cash flows were the same? In C, in B, you have 500 in the first year, 1800 in the second year, that's 2300. And in C, you have 1800 in the first year and five year, 500 in the second year, same 2300 in nominal cash flows. But why would C have a greater present value than B. Of the 93 persons online, could one person answer? Why would C be more valuable than B? Or why the present value of C would be more than B, despite they both having the same total nominal cash flow? Because you had a greater value in the first year. Anyone else has a? Sir, um, has President. anyone else has a none of you? Sir, sure. uh, yes, go ahead. Um, um, is it because the value today would be worth more than the value in the future? And how do you tie that to the first person's contribution? You're both on the same. Time. You're both on the same track, but if you only, if you only synergize that those two responses then you get get it spot on um sir you go ahead nathan yeah um it's because the timing of the cash flow since in you received the 1800 earlier so the discount factor would be smaller so you actually get more money instead of receiving the 1800 in the second year right so the discount factor would be higher in the second year that's why you're only getting 14,488 Thank you very much. So I feel happy that the three of you who answered are on the right track. All right, so learning is happening. <laughs> Good. But that's essentially it. Good, so let's move on. So if we extended the present value for all three projects, right? As I mentioned earlier, this in the text, they tend to 
look at the payback period in terms of years, but a more accurate thing would have been to do it in months uh, or in years plus months. So let's look at the first example. We would have, we would have recovered, and let's also just look at the nominal, um, the nominal amounts, right? So we just look at the 500, 500 and the 5,000. So if we had to recover $2,000, right? We'd have taken, you we, would have had an accumulation of, an accumulated amount, sorry, of a thousand at the end of year two. So we're looking for another thousand in year in period three. In period three, we had 5,000. So we're treating period three as 12 months. So to calculate the actual payback period using nominal cash flows in this, in this case, it would have been a thousand divided by 500, 5,000 multiplied by 12 months. And that would have given you the amount of um, months that you would have needed in that third period to recover um, the extra $1,000, right? So you would have gotten two years, well, this one say two months and how many days? Almost 14 days or 13 days, right? But that would have been the, the more accurate payback period here. Everyone follow? Or right, do we want to see it in Excel? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, so let's open Excel. So let's see the, the capital outlay. It's 2000, right? And you'll take it at some minus, right? And then in period one, so oh, let me just ensure that I put the right thing. So this is an outflow. So I'll put the right thing. So this is, and then we had the in. Then we have the inflows. So we have period one. The inflows of period one was five hundred. 500 and then the third period we had 5,000. So at the end of period one, we would have been out of pocket. Sorry. At the end of period one, we'd be out of pocket 1,500 and we continue the accumulation. At the end of period two, we would have been out 1,000. So we're looking for a thousand more in the third year. So we know this is two periods already. We'll assume that the 5,000 occurs equally over the 12 months, right? And we want to know how long it will take for us to get the additional thousand. So it would have been a thousand we're looking for divided by 5,000. And then we multiply it by 12 months. Right. So you get 2.4 months. It would have been, the payback period would have been two years plus the 2.4 months, All right? Any questions on that? Does that make life a little easier, simpler? So sir, with this, we would accept this one because it's less than the three years. No, remember the, remember the question says that two years or less. Two years is the benchmark. Okay. Good. Good. All right. So just to demonstrate the weakness of ignore or right, the weakness of ignoring cash flows that occur outside the policy period that you would have set. 
if you go back and you work with net present value, if you look at the end here, you see it's saying 20%, you should ignore that. It should actually be 10%. Because if you look here, you see the discount factor is 10, 10. So this should actually be 10%. So this should, if you're confused, or if you were confused while reading the book, this should be 10%. Ignore the 20%. But you see, if you look at the project and the cash flows that you have, or the estimated cash flows that you have, you'll see that despite period A, or sorry, project A having the, the longest payback period, it has the highest net present value. And B having a, well, not adding any value, detracting value from the company, right? By having a negative NPV of 58, and then C having a positive MPV of 50, so adding some value to the company. You'd recognize too that C would have had the shortest payback period, right? C would have had the shortest payback period uh, simply because they had the 1800 in the first year. And if you apportion the same, looking for 200 more in the second year, it would have been the 200 more upon 500 times the 12 months in the year and that would have given you the time that uh, the payback period for C. So it does demonstrates that uh, well, the superiority of net present value, which takes into account as much as possible the project uh, or the investment cycle. Sir, good evening. Before you go on, sir. Um, I'm kind of lost in this problem here. Mm -hmm. I am not clear when you said in Project A, you're trying to recover $1,000. Um, is that $1,000 understood or, or it's right within the lines of Project A? Good, so we look at Project A. Let's go back to Excel. So this is project A numerically. Okay. You invested 200,000, uh, 2,000, right? Yes, sir. Good. And in the first period, we got 500 in cash flow. Second period, 500 in cash flow. And the third period, we got 5,000 in cash flow. So remember the payback period is to calculate how long it will you will take in years to recover this amount. Okay. All right? So if in the first period we've recovered 500, then we have to recover, we are left to recover 1,500 at the end of the first period. After the second period, or in the second period, sorry, you would, re you would recover another 500. So at the end of the second period, you're left with 1,000, right? But because in the third period, you had a windfall of 5,000, you have to assume that the 5,000 cash flow occurs evenly over the year. And then based on that is how you calculate the, how long it will take for you to recover the $1,000 in that third period. So this is where the $1,000 come from. Okay, we sir. look at the cash inflow, first two period, less it from the capital investment, you still have to recover $1,000 in, in the third period, right? So the amount of time that it will take for you to recover that $1,000 in the third period, you can calculate it by it's $1,000 over the $5,000 you earn in the third period times the 12 months of the year, and that will give you 2.4 months. It will take you in the third period to recover that extra $1,000. So Ravi, you understand where the extra where the thousand dollars come from now, right? Yes, sir. Clear. Good. Cool. Good. So, any any other questions on this slide? Yes, sir. 
Um, I'd like you to make some sense out of a statement from the text before this particular um, example was displayed. It gives an, um, an example of the of the of someone using a washing machine and a laundromat. The choice of purchasing a washing machine rather than using the laundromat for a specific period. But a statement that I can't make sense out of is one that says if the cutoff period is four years, then the washing machine makes the grade. And if the cutoff is two years, it doesn't. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand that they're saying that if the payback period is shorter, then it's a problem for the person who's investing or, or, or have invested. I can't really remember the example that you, you talked about, Ravi. Um, and that's on which page? It's page 112. This is just on the payback notes, the second paragraph. Okay. I'll probably have to work it out. Um, work it out and then get back to you. Oh, sir, um, it's not it's not a working. You know, is a statement. Is right. is is a theory? I can't right. understand. But it's not, so, so what? A, what? A, all right, let's let's go through it now then, as we on it. Because I've done it through the break and come. Back. So what it says is this: It says uh, we suspect that you have often heard conversations that go like this. We spend $6 a week or around $300 a year at the laundromat. If we bought a washing machine for $800, it would pay for itself within three years. That's well worth it. We have just encountered the payback rule. A project uh, payback period is formed by a company number of years. It takes what is related cash flows, equal the initial investment. For a washing machine, the payback period is just under three years. The payback rule states that a project should be accepted if the payback period is less than the specified cutoff period. All right, so so Ravi, it, so so let's work through it. Uh, we go back to Excel. So we're saying that we spend $300 a year, right? So we spend $300 a year. Right. And, the, and the cost of a new one is 800. 800. Right. So the, the thing they're saying is say if the cutoff period is two years, right? So we're saying if we can't recover our eight hundred dollars investment in two years, we wouldn't take it. Right. But if we gonna if we if the cutoff period is four years, then we will take it. So we'll say in two years, you will only spend three hundred dollars times two, 600. So if we say that the cutoff period is two years, you will see that you will only recover 600 of that 800. So that's why it would make sense. If you were spending 400 or 450 in that particular year, in any particular year, then it would have made that cutoff period because you would have recouped that $800 within the two years. But if we crank it up to four years, then we say in four years, we'll spend 1,200, right? And 
we are only looking for 800 in that, in that four year period. So we would have come off $400 better. So that's why for the longer period, it would make sense and for the shorter period, it wouldn't make sense. Because in the shorter period, we're only, we would have spent 800 and we would have saved 600. So we would have still been out of pocket 200. But if it, the payback period is four years, we would, have, we would have invested 800 in the machine. And if we would li um, live life like use, using the laundromat every year for $300, then we would have in debt, then we would have spent $1,200. So it's $1,200 spending as against $800. Then of course, you know, the investment would have been saved. So that's the reason why if they extended the payback period, it would have made more sense to invest in the washing machine. Is that clear, Rob? Yes, correct, sir. All right, good. All right. So then finally, we look at the internal rate of return or otherwise call it discounted cash flow rate of return. So this is the rate, this is the discount rate that will give you an MPV of zero, right? So all the time when we've been using MPV this, we've looked at different MPVs, we've gotten positive MPVs, um, in some cases, negative MPVs, but the internal rate of return is that discount rate. But when you calculate the MPV of a project, you will get zero. Right. So the rule when of using the internal rate of return is that you'd invest in any project that is offering a rate of return. So having solved or having found that rate that is that will give an MPV of zero, if that rate is greater than the opportunity cost of capital then you will accept that project, right? In this example that we have here, you so say you can purchase a turbo powered machine tool gadget for 4,000. The investment will generate 2,000 in the first period, 4,000 in the second period, second year. And you ask, what is the, internal rate of return on this investment. So you solve for MPV equal to $4,000 as an investment, that's minus, that's an outflow, plus the inflows of 2,000 the first, and the rate where we previously saw it would have been a small R is now replaced by the internal rate of return. So that is what you would have had to solve for. If you would have gone through all of these calculations, we would have ended up at 28.08% as the internal rate of return. It so happened that this year we wouldn't be doing it in an exam and having to write it, um, which, I, which I suspect to some might would have been a challenge because of course, taking all of these across the, um, the equal sign, then it becomes square root. And, and if you had to do it for several periods, it would have become cube root and all of this. But luckily, I can teach you how to do it in Excel. So if I go to Excel, if I go to Excel, there's a function in Excel. So there's a function like, so regardless the capital that is needed, that would have been uh -huh. Uh -huh. 2,000. Okay. Or 4,000. Or call me wrong, um, call me wrong, 830. Okay, um, like what's happening? Okay. Sorry. 
Well, so the initial investment was 4,000. And then the first year, so the first year cash flow, now the inflow was 2,000. And then the second year cash inflow was 4,000. So calculate the IRR. We have a function in Excel. It allows us to do that. So you go to the same formulas, financial, you scroll the IRR. Right. You have to set up your you have to set up your worksheets similar to this. And all you do is just to highlight the series of data. You can leave guess a blank because it doesn't affect it. And then you hit okay. This is zero decimal place. If we increase it to two decimal places, we get exactly what we have in the exam. So this is the easy way to calculate IRR. If you use 28.08 .08 as a discount factor, right. if you use that as a discount factor, you'll see that you will work. If you work it out, you will end up at uh, MPV being zero. So if you, if you replace IRR here with the 28.08 as a discount factor, you will end up at zero. So that's the discount rate that will give you MPV of zero. Any questions? The students last year had to learn it uh, another way. That first you would have had to take, you would have to take, sorry, given the cash flows of 4,000, the well, capital out there, 4,000 and in, inflows of two and four, they had to first use a discount factor that will give them a positive MPV, and then another discount factor that will give them a negative MPV, and then they had to something called interpolation to find um, what the IRR would be. Well, luckily this year we don't have to do a written exam so I can show you in Excel. And really in the work like, instead of going through all of those tortures of interpolation, then you just do it Excel. Once you understand what is the, what the calculation means, uh, that is critical, right? So essentially in the conversation and it comes, an IRR comes up, the underlying thing to remember is that IR, the internal rate of return, is the discount factor that will give you an MPV of zero. And if that discount factor is greater than the opportunity cost of capital, then the project is a goal. We're given an example here of project A and project B. And in project A, so they both have, well, project A have a negative cash outflow in, in that period. At now, sorry, and then in period one, it has an inflow 1500. So the IRR is 50%, MPV at 10% at 10 is plus 364. And then B, you're receiving a thousand now and you're paying 1500 later. You see both projects have a 50% internal rate of return. What you should be if you're in confident situation uh, such as this, then you should be cognizant of which part of the deal you're on. In the first part of the deal, right, you are making an investment, so you're lending, and then you're receiving 1500 in the second period, right? So your internal rate of return is 50%, right? In the second scenario, that's project B, you're borrowing, so you're receiving a thousand dollars and paying fifteen hundred now. So despite both both projects, the IRR being fifty percent, you should be wary of which side of the transaction you are on. If you're on the if you're on the 
pro, uh, in project A, if you're the lending project A, mean you're giving out a thousand and receiving 1500 in a year's time, then you're in an excellent position. If you're in project B, and I don't think so, if you're paying 50% interest um, you know, in, in one year time, one year's time. So from a financial perspective, then as the lender, which you are in project A, you will seek to get the highest return. And as the borrower, you will negotiate to get or pay the lowest possible rate on the amount of money. So despite have, looking at two, when you're doing your assessments, when you look, you can look at several projects, they can have the same IRR, but it's critical that you, that you establish whether you're borrowing or you're lending, right? Any questions? If not, now we move on. There are cases where you have where a project will have two internal rates of return. Right? So that's two rates that will give you a net present value of zero. Right? And the reason that will occur is because you will have, if, if you look at your forecast, and let's say you have an investment of $1,000, so that's an outflowing now. And then you have a couple of years of positive inflows, and then you have a negative inflow, so every time the sign changes from a net inflow to a net outflow, then you have a, a rate of return at that point that will be equal to zero. So you can have projects with several rates of internal rates of return that will equal to zero once the sign of that cash flow changes. So once the net cash flow in that particular period changes from positive to right, from inflow to outflow, back the inflow, then you have several IRRs. So you should be cognizant of that when you look at when you look at projects. So for instance, if you if you would apply the Excel function using uh, in, in a case where there where there is change in signs of outflow uh, of cash flows, then you would have calculated it with giving you one value. And if, let's say, using these figures here, so the IRR in, in the example, given based on this graph is 3.5 and 19.54. So let's say you would have set a benchmark of 10%, right? When you've done your first calculation and you got 3.5, then you would have rejected that project uh, if you had an opportunity cost of 10%. And if you've done the second calculation, then you would have got 19.5, which, which of course would have changed your views um, on, the, on the project. Again, IRR is one, though it's the period the MPV and the accounting rate of return is yet another tool that companies use to screen towards deciding whether or not you should take a project. Ultimately, uh, it is the net present value calculation that is used um, to decide whether or not projects um, are undertaken or investments are undertaken. Well, at least that's from a, if I want to say, uh, an objective number crunching exercise. But you also know that projects and companies are not always undertaken based on financial rationale, but it might be a pet project of someone that is that has superior political clout in the in the corporation. So not all projects are undertaken for strictly financial reasons, right? And then there's a case where you can have a zero, uh, well, an internal rate of return could be non-existent, right? So there's no internal rate of return. And that can happen in instances where Having invested, you just have uh, negative uh, cash flows throughout the life of the project. So you never turn up. If you want to see, uh, I don't want to say project, but you never turn a positive 
cash flow or your negative outflows significantly outweigh your positive inflows. So you'll find that you have a zero IRR. Right. So if you do it in, in Excel, it will come up with an error message. So once you see that er error message, you will recognize that this particular uh, project doesn't have an internal reciprocal. Good, so that should take us to the end of and then a weakness of the IRR. So you have here two projects B and E in front of you. Project B has an internal rate of return of 100%. Project E have an internal has an internal return of 75%. Right. But if you calculate a net present value at 10% for both projects, D will have a negative, will have a positive net present value of 8,182, and E would have a net present value of 11,818. So if we would have stopped at the internal rate of return metric in setting whether or not so on the take a project, we would have chosen D, right? Because it has a higher internal rate of return. But if we would have gone a step farther and look at the superior net present value technique in deciding whether or not to accept projects, then you will recognize that despite project E having a lower internal rate of return, the actual value that it adds, adds to shareholders would have, would have been a lot greater than the value that D would have added, right? So the issue here with internal rate of return is that it ignores the magnitude of the project, right? The size of the project, the revenues garnered, the inflows garnered. So the question that is asked is what happens when there is more than one opportunity cost to capital? So there are sometimes, there are cases where a company may undertake an investment. And at the start of that investment period, they have one opportunity cost of capital, but they recognize that going forward at the potential, that situation will change. Right. So in using so in using the IRR, right? A couple of assumptions are made. One, they assume that the discount rate is stable during the year, uh, during the period of the project, sorry. Right. And then secondly, the other thing about IRR is that it assumes that that internal rate of return that you calculate, that all surplus funds would be reinvested and earn that same amount of interest, which is highly impractical given the last two examples that you had of 100% and 75%. So those are a couple of false assumptions on which, or I should say weak assumptions on which the internal rate of return is premised on, right? So just to recap that, in cases where there's multiple internal um, cost of opportunity cost of capital or required return, a project in applying the IRR, it just ignores that there is more than one opportunity cost of capital, so it says it is stable. And then, secondly, it, it assumes that all funds garnered would be reinvested at that IRR rate, and then, and which part, which is a very weak assumption. Any questions? Let me look at choosing capital investments when resources are Somebody scarce. Somebody said something. Somebody wants to say something? Yes, are you hearing me? Does Hello? someone have a question? Yes, sir, I have a question. Are you hearing me? I'm hearing you now. All right. Could you go for back the first assu false assumption about the opportunity cost? Right. 
Exactly. So I'm saying in some investment, in some investments, there are several opportunity costs of capital because you would, because based on a company's scenario, let's say point, let's say now they're on the taking that investment, they'll have a particular opportunity cost of capital, but they know that two or three years going forward, there will be a particular event, right? Let's say that financing from, from debt would have changed, right? Or they would have paid off that. So the opportunity cost of capital change changes then because now in the in the weighted average cost of capital or opportunity which you will come across a little later, they only have equity in it and there's no mix of debt. So they're not period. Now they have one opportunity cost of capital and then later on, you'll have a second opportunity cost of capital, which could be low or high, whichever, right? So they know that. So if we're looking at, let's say we're calculating MPV and we know now it's 10%, but then from period five onwards, it's gonna be 8%. We, we would have discounted those cash flows for the first four period at eight at ten percent, and then from the fifth going forward at eight percent. But IRR doesn't take that into account. What it will do is more than likely uh, look at it as just having one. Um, they will say when you calculate that MPV for those same cash flows and equal to zero. Let's say that MPV comes. Sorry, that IRR comes back at 15%. It will just use that 15% throughout, um, throughout the, the life of that investment. And discount all of those monies at 15% so that you get back to zero. So it doesn't take into account that the cash flows will be discounted at different rates at different periods during, during the uh, investment cycle. Is that clear? I hear you. Is that clear? Yes, it is. So basically, you're just using the one percentage. It's as if you're forgetting about the others. This is the assumption for the IR, IRR. Right, because yes, the assumption for the IRR is to find, remember you're finding when the MPV is equal to zero, right? So they just yes. want to find a value that's equal to zero. That's right, so they'll say that all the, the all the cash flows that you have in that period discounted at this whatever rate they find that would be the only rate during the period which is not you know um, the reality which is something weak right, right. So okay all right so again this is just um it is stronger than payback yeah, period but yeah. it's weaker than that. but these are all tools that you use um to aid in your decision making all right If you're not talking, just mute your mic. And then we come to the situation where you have limited resources. So resources are scarce and you have to prioritize. Right, so that's what you call capital rationing. So funds are limited and you can only invest in, you maybe have three options, but you can only invest in one or you can only invest in two. All right, but you can't do all three because you don't have um, the funds to cover that. So there are two types of capital rationing. So there's one that is internal, which is imposed by uh, management or the board, right? Whoever is the final decision-making body. So they will say, well, for this year, we only have this amount of funds available for investment, right? And then there's hard capital rationing. And this is, um, limits on available funds imposed by the unavailability of funds in a capital market. So for instance, investors in a capital market might say, well, we will stop investing in, let's say cars that run with petrol, right? So in some countries, there is a, there is a target that they've set that says by this year, everything will be electric. Um, so some investors will say, you know, we're not investing in cars that are powered by uh, petrol, but we're moving towards electric cars. So that's an example of, you know, hard rationing. 
right? So this is the external forces um, stating their position and stating their position by limiting the availability of, of their parts. Capital rationing, we apply something that we call a profitability index, right? Which is a measure of a project's um, or, uh, attractiveness. And it's calculated by dividing the present value of future expected cash flows by the invest initial investment amount, right? When we apply this profitability index, we look for a return that is greater than 1.0, right? So if you have a return that is greater than 1.0, is deemed a good investment, right? So the higher the values, um, the more attractive it would be. If you have projects that are mutually exclusive, meaning that you can only do one or the, or the other, then the rule is to undertake the project with the highest profitability index. Any questions? So when we're faced with, uh, when we are applying the profitability index, there will be situations where you can, that you have resources to cover maybe two projects or three projects. And there are different combinations. So what you do, is you go through an example and you see what I speak of. So here we have three projects, A, B, and C. Your initial investments are 10 million, 5 million, 5 million respectively. The net present value of these investments are 21 million in the case of project A, 16 million in the case of project B, 12 million in the case of project C. To arrive at the profitability index, it is the net present value of that project divided by its investment. So 21 divided by 10 will give you 2.1 profitability index. The second one, project B, to get, a, to get their profitability index of 3.2, it is the MPV of 16 million divided by the initial investment of 5 million. And for C, the profitability of 2.4 is derived by taking the NPV of 12 million and dividing it by the investment of 5 million. Right? So that's how you get the profitability index. Let us look at this example here. So, We only have 300,000 to invest, uh, which do you select? So project A costs, the investment is two, the MPVs for A is 230, for B is 141 to 50, C is 194 to 50, and B is 162. We've calculated the Profitability index, so A is 1.15, B is 1.13, C is 1.11, and B is 1.08. Remember the limiting factor here is we only have 300,000 to invest. So we can invest, um, so we only have 300,000 to invest, and we could only invest in the whole project. So we can do it part ways, so to speak, right? So you cannot take half of project C or half of project B. So you either take the whole investment or, or not. So we have a couple of options on the table, right? So if we look, are a couple of combinations that will fall below 300,000 or at 300,000. So we find the weighted average uh, profitability index for A. 
So A, the initial investment is 200,000, sorry. So to get the profitability, the weighted average profitability index of A is 200,000 upon 300,000 times the profitability index, right? And you will get 77, right? For the net option is B and C. So if we take B and C, we will get a total of, the total required investment is of B and C is 300,000. So that satisfies the limiting factor that we have or the limited resources that we have of 300,000. So the weighted average profitability index of B and C would be 1.13 times required investment of 125,000 divided by the total amount of the invest plus the profitability index of C, which is 1.11 times the, the required investment amount divided by the total limiting factor of 300,000 total. If we work this out, weighted average profitability index of these two in, uh, projects of 1.12. Then we can take B and D because B and D will add up to 275,000, right? So B and D, we take the same example what we take for B, profitability index of 1.13 times the, the amount required for the investment divided by the total amount available. Plus the profit uh, brackets again, the profitability index of project D of 1.08 times the required investment amount divided by the total um, amount that we have available to invest. And that will give us a weighted average profitability index of B and D of 1.01, right? Of course, the, there are other options in here that is below 300,000 because you can look at B alone and C alone and D alone and get three other options, right? But just looking at these three options, the combination of projects that we will select would be the one that has the highest weighted average profitability index, which in this case is a combination of project B and C. So with the limited, um, limited amount of $300,000 to invest, then the best option would have been to invest in project B and C. Are there any questions? Yes, sir, a quick question. Go ahead. Sir, you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Why is it that we even consider doing a weighted average profit um, profitability index for A because um, you mentioned the um, profitability, the profitability index must always be greater than one. Right. Or it's so just to show, or it's just to show, like right. It's just to demonstrate. Right. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. You say ideally, it should mm -hmm. be greater than one. So you could yes. have found, you could have, you could have ended up with a case where they're all below one. So there could have been 0 0.77, 0 0.65, 0 0.5. And then in that case, then you choose the one with the highest profitability index, which could have been 0 0.7. Which is closest to one. Right. Right. Oh, it's just, okay. it's ideally you want one projects that are greater than one. But, but if you end up with projects, none that are greater than one, then you just choose the highest. Okay. Right. So the highest doesn't serve. Being greater than one is a real situation. Oh. Or kind of so another observation. I notice the closer you get to the amount of money you plan to invest, you should have um, a positive rate, probably close to one or, or just over one. I wouldn't say that conclusively because it depends on on really on this. It depends on how much this MPV is of this investment. So this is what's really driving. So. The net present value of that investment is what's really driving this um, profitability index, right? 
And uh, all right, so I wouldn't say that conclusively. It's probably in this case. Or right, thanks, sir. Excuse me, sir. So don't make the rule. Go ahead, David. Um, I noticed that you own you did you merge the um the projects for every other one besides A. This is just a question for us. Right. If if despite we get the um the profitability index below. Uh, one, could we not have merged A with something else to give us a higher profitability index or that's not possible? Well, remember the limit in fact is 300,000. So whatever combinations we use must be 300,000 or less for it to be a meaningful uh, um, calculation, right? So if we, anything else that we, that we add to A will be greater than 300,000. So that's, uh, that's not possible. Right, so we can only undertake projects that are three hundred thousand or less. Right, so anything we add to A, and that's the reason why we didn't add C and D either, because that would take no taking us over three hundred thousand. So that's not possible because we just don't, we just don't have the resources to invest in that project, in those two projects, or any combination with A. We don't have more than three hundred thousand. So it's a worth it's it's. And it's, it's a worthless exercise at that point. So that's why we didn't do anything with A. That's clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. That's okay, David? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. Great. All right. I think we've been slug. I think we've been slugging it for a while. Uh, we'll take a break now. And during the break, ensure. So we got question one, which covers investment criteria, and you're asked to consider the following two projects, project A, B, uh, both require an initial investment of 200, and then you have cash flows for period one to four in project A, and project B, you have cash flows from period one to three. The first in A of question one, it asks you if the opportunity cost of capital is 11%, which of these two projects would you accept? A, B, or both? So we can stop share that. So we can work out the well, the first thing that we should do is work out the present value of both projects. So project A, so we have, the, we have the periods to the left, then the next column is the 11% discount factor taken to three decimal places, right? And then we have project A cash flows, project A discounted cash flows, which is the factor here multiplied by the cash flow. So this is, an, this is an embedded Excel sheet in Word. So you can just double click on it and get behind the figures. So you can see that this is equal to this multiplied by that. And then for period one, the project A discounted factor for period one, it is the discount factor times the cash flow. And if you add it all up, you get a net present value for project A of 4 to 9. And doing the same thing for project B, you end up at 4 to 5. Positive, both positive. So the answer to that question is that you would, of course, the question gives you no other uh, conditions for acceptance or denial of the course or rejection of the, of the project. So you accept both because they have a net positive um, net present value. Essentially what these calculations say is that they will add value uh, to the shareholder as well, or they add to the shareholder as well. So for part A, 
based on the calculations, both projects had positive net present value. So we would add, um, so we would accept both if there's no uh, limits on funds available to be invested. Any questions on part A? Are we all comfortable now with calculating net present value? Yes, sir. Yeah. So part B says uh, or asks, suppose that you can choose only one of these two projects, which would you choose? The discount rate is still 11%. So because you can only choose one of the projects, so it means that it's mutually exclusive, then you choose the project with the higher MPV. In this case, it's project A, which has an MPV of 49 compared to project B, which is an, has an MPV of four to five. Right. Is part B clear? Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Go ahead. Um, before, before calculating um, the values, right, you could have seen that A would have been a more favorable choice because the, the incomes for, for B stopped at three and the incomes for A, which would have been more when calculated, went on to four. So before even calculated it, you could have seen. Okay, all right. Hold on to the thought as we go to period C, ah, the question C. So question C asks you, or sorry, section, question C says, which one would you choose if the cost of capital is 16%? So if we look at 16% now, the cash flows has, has not have not changed but now the discount factor or the opportunity cost of capital is 16%. So David, you see what's happening here? Now the MPV for project A is now down to 24 and for project B, it's now 25. So eyeballing it is not necessarily, um, well, it's a good, uh, per ambulation, but we should always, always take into account um, the effect of the discount factor. So here clearly we're seeing a higher discount factor. And I suspect if we take it to 18% um, or 20%, then project B will come out um, with a higher MPV than project A. So having moved from 11% where project A was a lot more attractive than project B, and we're taking it now to 16% as a discount factor, the opportunity cost the capital. We're seeing here that project B now is the more attractive than project A. Right, David? So just bear that in mind. So does part C require any explanations? So we basically replaced, uh, we go find from the, the chart that I would have shared. Uh, we go, we find the discount factor for period one, two, three, and four. And we apply it to the cash flows. We get the discounted cash flows. We add up all the discounted cash flows and we get the MPV. Just remember it's an embedded Excel Sheet, so you double click here. If you double click a table, then it takes you behind, then it takes it to Excel, and you can see the, the calculations. Good. Any questions on C? All right. No, sir. So D, D asks, what is the payback period of each project? So for project A, by the end of year two, you'd have gotten 160, right? So we could add these. So for both projects, the initial capital outlay was 200. So we're trying to establish how long does it take to recover that 200, 
right? So here we're just using nominal cash flows, right? So just these cash flows as they are. And we go, so at the end of year two, you have 160 would be repaid. Now, we, now you assume that the 80,000 in, in year three is earned and they should be evenly and not nighttime as in evening. So they should be earned evenly plus $40 is earned in 40 upon 80 times 12 months. That'll be six months. So project A will have a payback period of 2.5 years and project B, uh, coincidentally, the cash flows coincide correct uh, exactly with what the initial investment of lay was. So that's two years. So you would calculate for project A, the payback period is 2.5 and project B, it's two years. Any questions on that? No, sir. Okay, to the student who wants to leave now, uh, the other class is held on Monday mornings. All right, and to the other student who is requesting the answer sheet, then the answer, the answer sheet is always posted um, Thursday night after the class or early Friday morning. So we go to D, part D acts. It says, if the project, if the project with the shortest period, is the project with the shortest payback period also the one with the greatest MPV? Right. Uh, the answer to that question is that it essentially depends on the ex, uh, discount rate that is used. All right, so we saw when we used the 11% discount rate, project A had the highest MPV. When we moved to the 16% discount rate, project B had the higher MPV. So the answer to the question E, it would be depends on which had the higher discount rate. Question uh, part F, sorry, says, what is, are the internal rates of return of the two projects? So we go to the Excel, so we double click just to go behind the scenes. So we go to Excel, we set up in the initial period, the capital outlay was 200. The inflows from period one to four was 80. And just applying the formula from Excel, we go straight. So we go formula, financial, we scroll to, scroll to IRR. And we double click on that. You pull the series of data and you click OK, and you will find it, all right? Uh, the same thing we do for over here. So yes, because I double up that one, so. Right. And that's what you do for those. So this IRR function is IRR, open brackets, from D to D5, and this one is from D two to D6 because you have an extra year of inflows. So the IRR for project A is 22% and project B is 23%. So given the two discount factors that we've used so far, uh, under which conditions we would have accepted the project if you were using the IRR as the rule for investment? So, so, so far in this question, we, question, we've used two other discount factors or two discount factor. Now we, two discount factors. Now we come up to, we've just calculated the IRR of 23 and 22%. If we apply the IRR rule, which um, are the projects you would have undertaken at which discount factor? Project B. Because you had a higher um, internal rate of return. So why not me? At which percent? Which discount factor? Oh, 
discount oh, which one discount factor yeah um it would have been well if if i'm looking at this discount factor or the chosen chosen uh, project a but not that you're looking at ir irr or a chosen project b all right anyone else uh, like to volunteer um sir i would have hmm. chosen both since the ir is for both of them is greater than the cost of capital of eight percent and eleven percent so i would have taken both all right thanks nathan anyone else has another idea go ahead all right all right so in fact um the reason that nathan gave is the reason why we would choose uh the projects using both discount factor because the rule with applying the irr is that once the irr is greater than the discount rate which in the first instance was 11 and in the second instance was 16 then you accept the project because 22 and 23 are both higher than 11 and 16. Good, so we go to G. G asks, does the IRR rule- Oh, because you want to tell it. Right, so G asks, does the IRR rule in this case give the same answers MPV? So in choose, so we'll go ahead. So in choosing between the two projects, if we're look, if we we're looking at if they're mutually exclusive projects and we had to just choose one, then we would have chosen project B. So the question in G asks whether or not the choice you make based on the IRR would have been similar to the choice you make using MPV. And we'll see, we see that using IRR, we're saying project B is superior. And it's only when we use a discount factor of 16%, then project B is um, superior applying the MPV rule. If we use 11%, then project A becomes superior. So it depends on the discount rate that is being used for MPV. All right. Then we go to H. So H asks, if the opportunity cost of capital is 11%, or states, so in H states that if the opportunity cost of capital is 11%, what is the profitability index for each project? Is the project with the highest profitability index also the one with the highest MPV? Which measure should you use to choose between the projects? H asks, asks is a few things. So just a reminder, the profitability index is the net present value upon the investment. So for project A, the net present value, if you apply it, and the question say that we should apply the 11% discount rate, you'll have an MPV of a project A of 49 upon 200. So that will be, the profitability index would be 0.245. And if you look at B, it will be 0.225. So in this case, the investment amongst are the same, both MPV and profitability index indicate the same answer. So you'll pick project A to 11% discount rate. So if there's no issues with capital restriction or then the profitability index is preferred and used to accept projects with the highest index, descending until capital is exhausted. But if there's a case of no um, rush in, then you accept all projects with, with a positive MPV. So just to go uh, recap this, uh, the middle part of it, if there's capital rationing, then you accept the projects based on ranking, prof profitability index ranking. Uh, just to the student earlier who spoke about having you know, one as the benchmark, 
as I pointed out, one is desirable, but you see clearly in this case, we're way below one and we're still adding value, right? Any questions? Good, yes, let's sir. move on um, to questions. I don't know if I missed something. I'm not sure if I missed something, but why are both projects 200? Wasn't one 80? Yeah, I think it's here certainly. under the yeah. profitability. Right. Did you look back? At, do you have the question, the worksheet in front of you? Yes, sir. Right. So you see, to calculate the profitability um, index is the investment divided by the net present value. Uh, look back at the, you see CO, they both are 200. So that means period now. So now the investment and it's, you see it's a minus. So it's an investment that they're making. It's an outflow. Both of the projects had an investment of 200. What is different is the inflows that you have. Those are the 80 and 100, so. Okay, thanks, sir. You're welcome. So let's move to question two. So here we calculate um, right. So we ask so we're looking at projects uh, D and E. And we assume the projects are mutually exclusive and that the opportunity cost of capital is 10%. And we're given a table below. And we're asked to calculate the profitability index of each project and then show how the profitability index can be used to select the superior project. Right. So just for, um, for a recap, I've worked out back the net present value of the projects. I mean, the table or the question gives us those information, but just to recap and for some students to understand where it came from. So in project D, we had an initial investment of about of 10,000. Of course, 10,000 the discount factor when you make that investment now is one. So that remains as is, and then you plus the inflows that you expect in, in, in one year's time of, of 20,000 divided by, the, by one plus the discount factor, right? Which is 10% in this case. And you'll get an MPV of $8,181.82. Same thing for project E, we require to invest 20,000 and then we have a cash inflow in cash inflow in year inflow in year one of thirty five thousand. We discount that at one plus the discount rate, and you get the net present value of that project of eleven thousand eight hundred and eighteen dollars and eighteen cents. To calculate the profitability index, we take the net present value of those projects and divide them by the investment required. In the case of project D, the MPV is, we take the MPV of $8,181.82 and we divide that by the required investment of 10,000 and we'll have a profitability index for project D of 0.82. For project E, we worked out the MPV of $11,818.18 we divide that by the required investment of 20,000, and we'll have a profitability index of 0.59, right? So each project has a positive um, profitability index, as plus both projects are acceptable. In- Sorry, before you go, go, go to- Yeah. There you see how you lay out that that work in there i understand it better that way i see what i have to divide i see where i get it from i see how i get it mm -hmm. all right so 
I'm happy that you're happy. Yeah, but when I have to work with Excel and all of that, it takes that it takes time, especially when you have to use it in the what exam. What you so gotta like work? how you work, how this I, I already know. Okay, if a question like this comes in the exam, I know what I have to look for and I can work it out. But the thing is, right? So um, I would think that the reason why we come to university is not only to pass the exam, but it's to go and perform in the real world. And in the real world, they want paper and stuff like this. They want it in Excel. So that's critical. So um, I'll encourage you to learn Excel. So if you go, you know, I mean, almost any, anything can do with finance, um, you know, they want Excel, trust me. So I advise you to, I think in the first lecture, I shared a link from the Corporate Financial Institute that runs well, a crash course on Excel. Take some time and go through it. And I mean, you might not grasp all in one go wrong. And if you don't use it every day, then you know you could forget some. But keep looking at it. Um, go, Mr. Siram. You have a question? No, sir, mistake. Sorry. All right. So um, for those who require the workings or asking for the workings, does this suffice? Does this make everyone comfortable? Yes, sir. Are those who have um, these issues or is challenged? If you stay quiet, then I'll assume it's so. All right, good. So let's go to part B of the question. So it's in order to choose between two projects, you must use incremental analysis. So I'm taking you to the long route now. So for incremental cash flows, we look at the larger project, less the smaller project, right? So, the, so check incremental cash flow. So remember incremental mean that extra, right? So incremental has, has, has connections or uh, to meaning something that is extra, right? So we look at the larger project and we less it from the smaller project. Right? So the larger project required an outlay of 20,000. We minus the smaller project of 10,000. So this is the capital part, right? This is the investment part. And then we have the cash flow part, right? And then we divide that by the uh, discount rate, one plus the discount rate. And then you find that the incremental cash flow from project E minus D is 3,636.33, right? So there's a long way we're going through now. So that's the incremental cash flow. So if we look at calculating now the profitability um, index for that extra amount, we'll find that we'll take this MPV that we just calculated here, this incremental MPV, and we divide it by the incremental investment that we require. So that'll be the incremental MPV of 3,636 divided by the incremental cash flow that we required of 10,000. And that will give us a profitability index or incremental profitability index of 0.36. And since the incremental profitability index is positive, then we will choose the larger project, right? And again, then we choose a larger project because it's driving, it will give more 
quality to the shareholder. Show you how it could have been done a lot quicker. So what, we did so what we did in the operation just now could have been achieved um, even quicker, right? So if we look, remember the aim of finance of, of this course is to ensure that whatever we do, add the maximum, add maximum shareholder value. So if we look at these two projects here, the one that is adding more shareholder value is project E, right? You see 11,800 against 8,000, right? So this is the figure that you really want to maximize. But we were using profitability index just now. And when we work out the profitability index, um, D had a slightly higher profitability index than E, right? But we couldn't stop there. Or we shouldn't stop there because we want, you know, the one with the higher MPV but we need to find out what's the incremental um, uh, profitability that index calculation. So what we could have done is to find the incremental MPV was D. So we could have taken this amount, minus it by this amount, and you'll get the same 36, whatever it was just now. And then the incremental investment is the large investment, less the small investment of 10,000. And we could have just divided 36, um, 36, whatever, 3,600, whatever, divided by the 10,000, and we would have gotten there far quicker than we got in the longer calculations. But I just showed the longer calculations so that people could follow a little bit more. Good. So, those who are on to me and on to the topic, a lot more, you can just use a table. You could have just used a table as is, get the incremental NPV from, from E minus D here and the incremental investment E minus D. And you do the same calculation for profitability index and we've got the extras. Good. So any questions before we go on to the second part? Sir, could you just say back again, what is the incremental? So the incremental, so anything that has to do with increment, it means that extra, right? So just get it back in mind. It means that extra. So the increment, uh, if we're looking at the two projects, the increment for the MPV, would be the larger MPV or the project with a larger MPV less the project with the smaller MPV will give you the increment, right? That change, yeah. right? That extra. Um, on the capital side, the project with a larger MPV less the project with a smaller MPV will give you that extra that you had to invest. Miss Han, if you could go ahead with a question. What if Yes, sir. What if you have a negative um, end figure? Would it would we select the um, the one with the smallest amount? So if you have a project with a negative MPV, well then, yes. uh, well for complete well first and foremost, if you have a project with MPV, then with a negative MPV, then it's not adding value. I know. Right. So straight off the bat, and if you got to calculate the in increment from a negative MPV to a positive MPV. I mean, it's the same process you go through it. Um, I mean, without even doing any other calculation, you could just state the, uh, well, not assumption, but just state that, that fact that, you know, oh. the mere reason that it's not adding value, then there's no even, there's no um, no meaningful reason to calculate increment. Because you don't know the one with the positive MPV is, is going to be superior, right? Thank you, sir. I would, so I wouldn't even go through the stress of calculating incremental um, profitability index or incremental, you know, um, MPV once it involves one with the negative MPV. Right. 
Good. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right, so let's go into the second part. So the second part is uh, we're gonna apply the MPV rule and then we use the MPV rule to choose among projects. Um, we look at investment time and decisions, the choice between long and short lived equipment, uh, when to replace an old machine and costs of excess capacity. So rule one when applying the N net present value rule, right? We only discount cash flows and not profits. So remember cash flows, non profits. If we're given a financial statement, an income statement, remember there are items that are included in the income statement that are not cash. So for instance, you have things like uh, typically depreciation. Uh, that's not a cash flow. You may be given income statement that says revenue is so much, but you would have sold um, a certain percentage on a cash basis and the other on profits, on um, holdover, so mean on credit. So you will adjust for things like that. Um, it can say things like you bought supplies, some on cash, some have a period of, you know, you're given credit for so many days. So those things that you should take into account, right? Those are some of the things that can come in questions that you'll need to adjust. So you focus on strictly when cash comes in, when it goes out, right? We would know that all sales is not, when we look at the income statement, all sales is not cash sales. Some is uh, credit. Same thing with taxes. You could look at an income statement and you can see the taxes in the income statement is seldomly the taxes that has been paid, but it's tax that is payable. So for instance, you, you're preparing your, um, your, let me see if you can get, right. You prepare your financials to the end of this year and after the auditors would have done the audit and so forth, they will come up with a position that the taxes are payable. And often, now what we're doing here and here, here you're expected to pay advanced taxes. So you would have paid some advanced taxes during the year, uh, unless you're a magician, then you'd have correctly, um, I mean, your advanced taxes are based on the previous year's income. Right. Um, so it will sell them your previous year income and this year it's income will sell them to be the same. So you have a, a difference there. Right. So when you look at the income statement, the amount this year's tax payable is sell them the amount that you would have paid already. Right. So you, I, there you have to make another adjustment. Right. So rule one, when we're doing discount, when we're doing a net present value, we only discount cash flows. So whether they are of a capital nature or a working capital nature, right? Um, the second rule is that we discount incremental cash flows, right? So anything that is incidental to the decision that you take now, those are the things that goes into the cash flow. So for instance, if you, let's say you have a, you are, you, you're in the pharmaceutical industry and you are working on a particular drug, right? So you've invested significant amount of money there. And for some reason or the other, you got to a point where you recognize that it's not making sense anymore. Right, it's not making sense anymore. So you pull the plug on that project. And let's say a little while after you start with a similar project uh, that includes the use of those, uh, I would say, development apparatus equipment that you would have had before, right? So that those are already there. I decide to use those same equipment apparatus to develop another drug. So when you decide to look at uh, the cost for that new drug, you will not include um, those 
equipment costs that were already there, what we could be considered sunk costs, right? Those are not included because you didn't, um, those costs were not incurred as a result of this new effort that you undertake. There is also, you should also be mindful of accountants. When they look at initiatives, they like to allocate costs to almost everything that happens in a company, right? But you should be mindful if those overhead costs are already there, that you should not absorb any or they, sh or they should not be included in the, in the cash flows, right? And then there's also salvage value. So you will have a particular equipment for a particular project. Let's say the project is five years and at the end of the five years, the economic use of that, pro uh, that equipment is not completely exhausted. So you'll have a scrap value, you'll have a, a salvage value. That value that you estimate should also be included in the cash flow because at the end of the day, you sell it, uh, you dispose of it, you'll get some income. So that should also be included in the project. There's also cases where you will, as a result of the investment that you make, uh, you, it, will, you, you, it will result in some savings. So those savings are also um, included in the calculations. Then there's also a case where as a result of, in, of this, uh, undertaking this new investment, that you lose, um, let's say, there's some cost that is incurred in another section of the company, right? So you might have been, um, one particular equipment would have been used to, let's say, manufacture product, uh, product A in the past, but as a result of you undertaking a project now in, um, that entails the manufacturing of project B, if you would have taken that equipment and, uh, and allocated now to the project B, and it means that project A would have lost revenue, then the loss of that revenue on project A will now also project B, right? So those are some of the, those are some of the things that you should um, take into account. So those are the incremental cash flows that the result of, because you would have taken uh, a particular decision to invest in this, uh, to make this new investment. The third rule is that you should treat inflation consistently. So if you remember in I think the last two lectures, you would have had um, formulas that show the relationship between nominal rates and interest rates and, and, and real rates. So use nominal interest rates to discount nominal cash flows and use real interest rates to discount real cash flows, you will still end up back at the same answer. And this example should bring this out to you. So in this example, you invest in a project that will produce real cash flows of $100 in your zero. Um, and then 35, 50, and 30 in the three consecutive years, right? Uh, if the nominal discount rate is 15% and the inflation is 10%, what is the MPV of the project? And then we're, if you remember from our previous lecture, we were given this formula. So the real discount rate is one plus the nominal discount rate divided by one plus the inflation rate minus one and from that, you'll get a real discount rate, right? So you can discount the cash flows at a real discount rate, or you can use the, mini, um, the nominal discount factor and apply the inflation rate to these cash flows, and you should essentially end up at the same answer. So let's see how that works. So on the left, we're just using the nominal figures. So in year zero, we, had, we made an investment of $100, Right, so the discount factor will, for any investment made now is zero, is one, sorry. So applying a discount factor of 15%, you will still end up with an outflow of $100. The real cash flows that we were given are 35, 50, and 30. 
if we apply, we first apply the, this, the inflation rate. So we had 10% in year one and we compound it in, in period two, same for period three. So now the in, uh, inflated cash flows or the real cash flows times the inflation rate will give you 38.5, 6.5, We use these inflation adjusted rates, um, cash flows. We discount them at the nominal discount rate of 15% and you'll end up with an MPV of 5.5, right? <laughs> so here we're taking the real cash flows adjusting them for inflation. And then these cash flows, which are adjusted for inflation are then uh, discounted at the 15% nominal discount rate. And that will give you 5.5 on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we're gonna use now the real discount rate. We reminded that the real discount rate formula is one plus the nominal discount rate upon one plus inflation rate minus one. The nominal discount rate is 15%. So that is one plus 0 0.015 divided by one plus inflation. That's one plus 0 0.01 minus one. And that will give you a, re a real discount rate of 0 0.45 or 4.5%. <laughs> so we now we discount the real cash flows, right? As given in the questions, so we ignore inflation. We take the real cash flows, we discount it by the real discount factor, and we end up back at 5.5. So this example demonstrates that once you be consistent with how inflation is treated, then you will be end up with the same bottom line. That doesn't change. Any questions? I just go back how you get the one, the five point five. Could you speak up? Can you go over back how you end up with a five point five? So we add all of these, all of these um, cash flows. You add them, you'll get five point five. Okay. Right, so period one, the cash flows a hundred dollars, and then these cash flows is as a result of you taking the inflation adjusted um, cash flows divided by the discount rate, and you get these cash flows. You add all of them up together, you get five point five. The same thing goes for here. Sir, but if you add sorry, the 3.48 plus 4, the 5.75 plus 26.23, I am not getting 5.5. I'm getting 105.5. You have to subtract 100. Oh, oh, all right, good. Thank you. Okay, great. Good. All right. Any other yes, questions? Sir, the minus 33. Could you repeat that? Sorry. Starting minus 33.49 is a mistake. Oh, yeah, you're correct. That should be positive. On the yeah. Yeah. Right, that's correct. That should be positive. So, sir, I'm getting 5.57, which will be 5.6. Okay, don't kill me for one. And <laughs> don't kill me for the one. All right, but thanks for picking up the one with um, the minus third. The treaty should actually be positive. So thanks for picking that one up. Good, any other questions? Okay, let's move on. So as I explained just now, you gotta remember to, uh, to deduct taxes. The, and that's actually the taxes paid. Ideally, when you do the calculations for MPV, you want to use the cash flows after taxes, right? 
you want to use tax flows after tax, so the after tax cash flows that you want to use when you're doing um, calculation of MPD. And I went through the whole exercise just now of, of explaining to you why, why taxes paid are normally different from taxes reported in the income statement. So, good. Um, Sean. So when we look at, there are essentially three elements of um, a project cash flow. So there's cash flow from capital investment, then there's operating cash flow. Uh, so that's cash flow from normal trading. So buying, selling, um, the expenses you incur in producing whatever you're gonna sell. And then, or you're gonna provide in the case if it's a, if it's a service, and then you have um, cash flow from changes in working capital, right? So that will come about, for instance, if you're new into a particular line of business, uh, because you might not have the clout as you go in, into that new line. So you will might not be able to demand that everything you sell, you sell on cash. So you might end up, or you might not be able to purchase everything on credit. So you might end up with, a, with an imbalance where in the early stages of your business, you, don't, you do not, garner enough inflows um, to offset when those bills become due. So in that case, you will have to inject some working capital to ensure that you can pay um, your bills when they get due, waiting until your business could pick up, right? So that's it for the three elements of project cash flows, right? You know, capital investment is investment in property, plant, equipment, right? And I explain operating cash flows from the you know, revenue from sales, from new project outlays, less whatever costs you have to incur. And then investment in working capital is just um, you physically putting money into the business to ensure that you can pay your bills when they come, become due. Right. That is also treated as a as a negative cash flow. So if you have to put in more money into the business, that is treated as a negative cash flow. Okay. So a couple of challenges with, um, with MPV. So there's the investment time and decisions. So there are some times that you are faced with, you, you have a project and you can you can, um, you would have done your forecast of cash flow. And if you, you can, if you don't, you can undertake the project now or, you know, a couple of periods in, in the future. And there are some times that you recognize that in undertaking the project in a future period, it might be more beneficial um, to the shareholders right, of, of the company. So one of the issues is investment time and decisions. Let's look at, at this example. So in this example, you're told that you, you own a timber concession, right? And then you have, or you're also told that you have a weighted average capital of 10%. It also states that the longer you wait, the higher the investment required. But you also think that the price of lumber would increase, right? Good. So you estimate your future cash flows to be this. So in year one, if you want to take the project um, now, if say so if you invest twenty thousand uh, fifth and now. You expect your year one cash flow to be 64.4, year two will be 77.5, year three, 89.4, year 400, year five, uh, 109, right? So these are net future values. And then the second, then below here, it just gives you a change of the value year upon year, right? So if we go from year zero to year one, we would have had 14.4. Uh, so we had 
additional value of 14.4, and to get the percentage change, it would be that 14.4 upon a 50 multiplied by 100. So that's how you get this percentage change. And it percentage change from um, year one to year two would have been, um, this here would have been 13.1, right? Yeah, 13.1. 13.1 upon 64.4 would give you a percentage change of 20.3. And you, you go on like that, right? So that's how this percentage change um, comes about. And then we apply the 10% discount rate to these future cash flows, or future, right? Future cash flows using the discount factor for whatever year. So in year one, we would have um, taken the cash flow of 64.4, divide that by one plus the discount factor. So that's what um, 64.4 divided by 1.1. That should give you 58.4. And then we take year two cash flow, 77.5, seven uh, divided by the year two discount factor, or sorry, divided by one plus 10% both in brackets, um, square root, right? And then we do for all the others. And we would recognize that if we start the investment in the fourth year, that is when we will have the highest net present value for the project. So in this case here, you're saying it will be beneficial to delay the project until the fourth year, because one, this Despite, uh, we say we, we wait until year four because then you'll have the higher um, net present value. So sometimes it's it's um, it's a challenge to decide when to start the project. But it's safe to say that once you would have um, done the calculation of future cash flows, you apply the discount factor and you see from which year you can start and when the project will have the higher NPV. So in this case, it's year four. Right? So it's not always, uh, you should examine as, as, a, as future finance managers when is the best period to start. And starting now is not always the, the best choice. Um, because you, you will, you would, despite knowing that things will in, in um, prices would increase over time, but you will also know there's a possibility, as this example demonstrates, that um, one, you will have more trees to sell, and two, you expect the price of lumber to go up. Right. Good. Any questions? So the second problem that we, we face is making a choice between long and short-lived equipment. So to settle this issue, we look at what we call equivalent annual cash flows. And this is, so, so what we try to do, you will have, you might have assets or you might have projects with different life. Um, spans and you might recognize that in doing the calculation that you might be spending um, less and this is looking at uh, principally keeping assets in service right so you might look that you might spend less in a two years compared to three years or in a four years compared to five years but because the period is not the same the comparison is off. So the thing to do is to look at the equivalent annual cash flow. Right? And if you look at this, so the equivalent annual cash flow is actually the exact calculation you do for an annuity. Right? So you find the present value of the cash flows and you divide it by the annuity factor. So let this example, so we're given this example, given the following costs 
from operating two machines and a 6% cost of capital, which machine has a lower equivalent annual cost. So machine one in year zero uh, in time zero is 15, B is 10, and the cost in thousands for period one, five, and um, is five for year from period from year one to three. And for machine B is six in year one and two. So we recall all of this is cost, right? So the MPV, because in period zero, you're spending this amount and then to acquire the machine. And then in period one to three, this is the amount that you, as it says here, it's cost, I guess it's maintenance cost, same thing for B. So you wanna find which one really costs you less. The MPV of both machines are calculated in the instance of machine A, and we're using 6% discount. In the instance of machine A, it's 28.37, and machine B is 21. Right. So again, we can, we can go to the uh, discount factor table. We know the cash flow is five. We see what is the year one factor, you multiply by five, same thing for, and we could do it right through to year three, and we should get 28.37 and 21 for machine B. So if we look at it just like this, we can say without doing any other, well, next, without going through the other step of finding the equivalent annual cost, then we'll say machine B is, you know, is cheaper, um, because it's only 21 compared to 28. But then we're required to do the calculation to get the equivalent annual cost. And to get the equivalent annual cost, what we do is to take the MPV that we calculated and divide it by the three years and annuity, um, the 6% three years annuity factor. And we should end up with 10.5. Six one as the annual equivalent cost, and in the case of that's equivalent to machine A, in the case of machine B, we'll take the present value of twenty one and divide it by the two years annuity factor. And uh, let me see if I can. So if we use the, let me just bring up the table for you. Good. So the top is the present value table, the bottom is annuity table. So we're looking at 6%. So in the case of, uh, of case of project A or machine A, sorry, we take the present value that we calculated and divide it by the three years annuity factor of 2.673. And that will give us the annual equivalent cost. And in the case of machine B, we take the present value of 21 and divided by the second year annuity factor of 1.833 and that will give you the annual or the equivalent annual cost. And that is what you'll use to compare uh, the two machines to decide which one will cost you less on an annual basis. Any questions? Are there any questions? So you would have seen annuity calculations earlier, I think two lectures ago or a lecture ago, and the same principle has been applied here. So when we compare, when we compare uh, machines of different 
periods, then the comparison we make is the annual equivalent annual cost and the, which, and the one that is lowest is the one that is the only selected. So just to recap in this example, we are given the cash flows, we are given the discount factor, you work out the present value of those cash flows. All right, having worked out the example in those cash flows, we go and we find for the same discount factor, the whatever period it is, the annuity factor for that period, and we take the present value calculation divided by annuity factor to get the equivalent annual cost. And then based on that, you make the comparisons. So in this case, it is cheaper to have machine A for three years than to have machine B for two years. Any questions? So what were you saying about divide annuity by something? So to get the annual- Could you please cost, repeat that part? So to get the annual equivalent cost or the equivalent annual cost, you take the present value, right, of the cash outflows in this example, because you your focus here is costs and cost is things you pay. So those are outflows. So you work out the present value of those outflows and then you take the annuity factor for whatever period it is based on the same discount um, or cost of capital and you divide those cash flows, that present value cash flow, um, the present value of those cash flows by the annuity factor for whichever year it is. Yeah, Does anyone else have thanks, sir. Any other questions? So, sir, in other words, the 28.37 is um, divided by the five? No, no, no. So, the 23.87 is divided by the third year annuity factor, which is. So, you come back, you use this table. Okay. So percent, you get a third year annuity factor of 2.673 and you get the annual cost for machine A and for machine B, which is three, two years, you take the two years annuity factor for the 6% discount rate or the 6% interest rate, sorry. Any other question? All right, so when to replace an old machine, so problem three. So in this example, we're told the machine is expected to produce a net inflow of 4,000 this year and next year before breaking. You can replace it now with a machine that costs 15,000 and will produce an inflow of 8,000 per year for three years. Should you replace it now or wait a year? All right. So with the new machine, so again here, this discount factor is 6%, right? So we're using a discount factor of 6%. So the new machine, you have to invest 15,000. And in year one, you'll get from year one to three, you'll get inflows of net inflows of 8,000. So applying the discount factor, you'll get 3.8. 6.38, right? Net present value for that. Applying the same three year, 3% um, annuity factor. So we take the net present value of acquiring that new machine divided by the three years annuity factor. And we have an annual equivalent cost of 2.387 for the three years, right? So that will be the annual cash flow. Right. Because the MPV here is, is um, positive, divided by the three years um, annuity factor for the 6% interest rate, you will get positive inflows each year of 2.387. So you're comparing these 
annual cash inflows with inflows here of 4,000, right? So even by looking at it, so the 4,000 in one year, you, you can, um, you discount that by the 6% factor for year one. So you can take 4,000 in period one. So 4,000 divided by 1.1, 1 1.06, 1 sorry. Divided by 1.06. And we get that 1.06 by taking one plus the discount rate of 6%. So that'll be 3,773 in the first period. And then you do the same thing for the second period using the second year discount factor. And clearly comparing just based on the first period, you're comparing an annual, equivalent annual cash inflow for the new machine of 2.87 thousand compared to a discounted inflow for the new machine cash inflow. So that 4,000 discounted would give you in the first period, 3,733 and 73, right, 0.58. So clearly you can see if you still keep the old machine, you will generate more inflow than if you have, um, than if you buy a new machine that will only last for three years, right? Good, so that's the answer to that question. Any questions, any comments or questions? So the equivalent annual cash flow is basically the present value over the annuity factor, right? Uh, right, over the three years annuity factor, because you see this projection go for three years, right? So we do, we do it for three years. So you go back to that, the, all, the table that I had just now, you find the interest rate of 6% and you find, and you also, then you go down to the three years and get that, um, annuity factor and use that to define the NPV and that will give you the equivalent annual ca cash flow here. Right. And to compare it with the old machine, then you take these 4,000 that you have in year one and year two, you discount them at 6% and you compare it with these annual inflows. And you will see that um, those are greater than the inflows that you have here. Good. Any other questions? Okay, good. Let's move on. And then there's cost of excess capacity. So computer system costs 500,000 to buy and operate at a discount rate of 6% and last of five years. So again, we take um, we can take the 500,000, go find the, let's do it. So, so we get 6%. We go to find the five years discount factor, All right? So that's four point. Two one two. Let me go back here. So that's five hundred thousand divided by four point two one two, and that will give you well one eighteen point zero eight. When they've given you well one eighteen, if you use the factors on the sheet, you'll end up with one eighteen seven zero eight, which is just eight dollars different as the annual equivalent cost, right? But if you undertake, if you un undertake the product in year four as a present value of, of course you use the year four discount um, factor and that'll give you 894,000 if you undertake it, the project in year four. All right. Sorry, can I see screen? Could you repeat that? I can't see your screen. Oh, sorry. It's okay. All 
Okay, I need to find it now. Right, so in terms of excess capacity, so if it will operate for five years, well, if you can buy for 500,000, it will last for five years, the equivalent annual cost is the same process that we went through. And if you wait and undertake the project in five years time, then you just take the annual equivalent cost and discount it by the four year discount factor, and that will give you the present value now. And that should be us to the end. I know tonight was a real slug. Well, let us now work through the examples, just short examples, and we should be fine. So, so question three and four, not too long questions. So go or no go, a company manufactures product X, which it sells for $5 per unit. Variable costs of production are currently $3 per unit and fixed cost is 50 cents per unit, right? A new machine is available which would cost 90,000 but which could be used to make product X at a variable cost of only $2.50. So you see the difference. So currently we're doing it at $3. If we invest in a new machine, we get 250. So we're we're, we're having a savings on variable costs. So when we start to do the calculations, that 50 cents difference should be taken into account because we're saving 50 cents by, if we decide to invest in this new machine. We go on to, it goes on to say fixed costs, however, will increase by 7,500 per annum as a direct result of purchasing the equipment. Right, so that's also an incremental cost. So because if we decide to buy this equipment to make product X, we will have to pay an additional $7,500 in fixed costs. So that again is an incremental amount, right? The machine would have an expected life of four years and a resaleable value after that time of 10,000. So remember we spoke about salvage value, scrap value earlier. So this is where this 10,000 comes in and could be categorized as salvage value, right? So that also has to be included in, in the cash flows and that will happen in year four. And then it says the sales of product X are estimated to be 75,000 units per annum, right? Company A expects to earn at least 12% per annum from its investments. So here the expected return is 12%. So this is another way of expressing the opportunity cost of capital or the discount rate. If further says ignore taxation, you're required to decide whether company A should purchase the new equipment. Good. So that's the question. Let's go to the answer. And work the calculations, right? So question three, the first part of it is to calculate the savings. So we will, we will manufacture 75,000 units per year. We will save 50 cents per unit uh, in variable cost per unit. So that's the old $3 minus now, if we invest in the unit being 250. So that's the savings you make on variable cost. So that's 50%, 50 cents. So based on the amounts produced annually, the savings would be 37,500, right? But you will also incur an extra cost, extra fixed cost of 7,500. So the next net savings of, on, of um, acquiring this machine would be 30,000, right? So in year zero, we require to invest 90,000 for the new machine Using the 12% discount factor, the present value would be 90,000. We use the same table we had just now. We would have savings in year one to four of 30,000. And then when we sell the machine in year four, we get 10,000. 
using the discount discount rates or the discount factor of 12% in the various years. So year one, you go back to that same sheet that I showed just now. You see it's 0.893. You go down all to year four. The present value of these cash flows is 30,000 times the discount rate. 30,000 times the discount rate will give you this. Again, this is an embedded cash flow, uh, embedded Excel sheets. You can double click on it. And then you'll see when you add up, add up all these cash flows, you have, you have an MPV of 7,500. So since the MPV is positive, right, you should accept the project. So it would be, it would be beneficial now for the company to buy the new machine because you end up with an MPV of 7,500 when you have a required rate of return of 12%. Any questions on question three or clarifications? Sorry, that's I see. I see you have year four, two times, which is one is 30,000, one is 10,000. Right, so Arvin, I decided to keep it separate because I didn't want to just put 40,000 in the, in the year four. I just wanted to keep the salvage value separate from the normal savings, right? Uh, oh. When we get more, when we, when we as a group get more um, comfortable with these calculations, then I could have just lump it together. But it's okay and fine for you to lump it together, the savings plus the salvage value. That's fine. Right? But I just separated it just so that people could understand more where it came from. So when they see 10,000, they could strike and say, oh, well, that's a salvage value. Any other questions? All right, so let's go to four. So question four says, a widget manufacturer currently produces 200,000 units per year. It buys widget Lids from an outside supply at the price of two production costs are estimated at $1.50 per lid. Uh, the necessary machinery would cost $150,000 and would last for 10 years. This investment could be written off immediately for tax purposes. The plant manager estimates that the operation would require an additional working capital of $30,000, but argues that this sum can be ignored since it's recover recoverable at the end of the period or the end of 10 years. If the company pays a tax, pays tax at the rate of 21% and the opportunity cost of capital is 15%, would you support the plant manager's proposal? Clearly state any additional assumptions that you make. Lots to consider there. So we state the assumptions first. So we say that the four wheel manufacturer widgets for at least 10 years at the constant level. We said there is no inflation or technological change. Um, the 10% cost of capital is appropriate for all cash flows and is a real after tax rate of return. Uh, we further assume that all operating cash flows occur at the end of the year. We cannot ignore incremental working capital and recovery because simply when you inject the working capital at whatever period, at the end of the period when you recover it, you also have to treat it as an inflow. So when you inject the working capital, it goes in an outflow, you discount it with whatever at the appropriate discount rate. And at the end of the period when you get it back, you treat it as an inflow and discount it at whatever rate. In this question, you recover it back in years 10, so you'll discount that inflow at the year 10 discount um, rate or discount factor. And then you say that the firm has sufficient profits that can be increased by the tax shield. Okay. So to compute this, um, I've shortened the, I've shortened the um, calculations for you. So if the purchase it is two dollars a lid, two hundred thousand per year, and then you have a tax shield of one minus, so the tax shield is always one minus the tax rate. 
that will give you the tax shield. And then you multiply that by the uh, 15% annuity factor. And that will be the cost because everything remains constant, right? So to purchase it, so to purchase it, you'll just go to, you will take the cost of purchasing will be the cost you pay times the tax shield multiplied by the 10 years annuity factor for a 15% discount rate. And you'll get a purchase amount of $1,586,004. And then to make it, you have to buy a machine of 150,000. You have to invest working capital of 30,000. So there you are, right? These are the investment. But it does, and then plus, so these are the investment, this goes out. But it says that you can also write off this initial investment in the capital, right? You can write off this immediately, but you will only benefit from the taxes that you would have paid. So it would have saved you, once you had written off this immediately, taxes of 21%. So you add back that taxes that you would have um, saved, and then you minus now, the cost to manufacture the, two, the um, 200,000 lids. So you would have estimated that the cost of manufacture was a dollar fifty times the 200,000 multiplied by the tax shield, which is one minus the tax rate. And then you multiply all of that by the 10 years, 15% annuity factor, right? So this, that's gonna work out the cost aspect of it. And then finally, you add the cash flow, the working capital cash flow that you get back in the third year, in the tenth year, and you calculate the present value of that using the dividing that by the one plus the discount factor, fifteen percent to the tenth power, right? And that should give you the present value, the net present value of making it in house, which would be one million three hundred and thirty. 1,533. So just to recap the make part and the, the, the sections in the make part. So you have the investment here, right? So investment of 150 in the, in the equipment, investment of 30,000 in working capital. And then because you have it, you can write off that entire investment in the equipment, you will save taxes of 10.1%. So this will make up your net investment in working capital and the equipment, right? And then in the second part, you're calculating here, the cost of making the lids in house times the tax shield times the discount factor. And then when you get back the working capital in year 10, you discount it. And you should add them all up together. You'll get the NPV of making it in house of 1,330,530. So it's cheaper to make it in house than to buy it. And that's it for tonight. Any questions? Sir, after the test on Sunday, do we have another test before the holiday? Uh, every two weeks is a test. So I think it's yes. Um, sir, just excuse me. Um, the test on Sunday it was it will be focused.